definitely not a truck. But. Hey guys, this is Josh with Depth Tape Channel. In this video, we're going to be going over what happens when a truck mechanic, me, works on equipment. You sold your soul to Satan. So this little excavator 305 came in, and it had an engine problem, luckily, because I like working on engines. And this is a cat engine, right? Uh, well... Wrong. Anyway, so it has some oil leaks, but the biggest problem is it stumbles, and they say it seems like the fuel system's looming, losing prime. Uh, not sure why that would possibly have an oil leak there, type fitting dipstick, or as Cat likes to call it, an oil level gauge. Now, this is the hydraulic section, but also we have our fuel filter here, and it seems to be a little more wet than the surroundings, so that's interesting. Now, this is sitting in the operator station or cockpit, or I'm not really sure what, and I'd actually only driven this into the shop. That's the first time I've ever been on an excavator. And someone had to show me how to use it. Luckily, some of the features are the same, like turning the key starts it, but that's pretty much where it ends. Now, anyone that operates equipment or is familiar with it is probably going to think I'm a moron because it's fairly easy to operate. It's just much different than, obviously, a truck or a car. And this, the joysticks here control it. This one, once it's running, will actually engage the hydraulics, so then everything will work. As long as that's in the up position, nothing will work. The right joystick here controls the stick, or the excavator arm, whatever you want to call it. Up and down, pretty simple. And then we have our little blade here that's controlled by this. And point it back, we'll raise it. And pushing it forward, it will lower it. But we don't have a hydraulic problem here. We have an engine problem, luckily. Now, the throttle, like, there's no throttle pedal, like a vehicle. We have a throttle control switch here. So you can hear it's running, obviously. And it does hiccup occasionally. It'll stumble. Not sure why it's doing that though. This doesn't have an ECM, so there's really no, there's no codes or anything to check. But uh, it does have a few fuel oil leaks on it. The dipstick tube was loose. The oil supply adapter. And the oil leaks are pretty easy to figure out. So dipstick tube, obviously, this little plug, but the biggest one here was this oil filter adapter. It just needs an O-ring to fix that. The thing that's weird is this is awfully dirty. Like, if you look at everything else, it's, I mean, it's got dirt on it. It's a trick of dirt moving piece of machinery, but it's like this is leaking fuel or something. Now, you know, it's plastic scrap. And the lines. So here's something interesting. This is the priming pump. Hand priming pump. Now it's running okay. This thing doesn't push a lot of fuel, but if you hand prime it. Hear the engine? It's like it's sucking air. So we're going to troubleshoot that. Also, I was looking for the hydraulic filter. I couldn't find one. It's actually in here. So I did not know that. I had to look it up on set. Now, cat really sucks on these. Uh, it doesn't give any fuel pressure specifications. It really just talks about the pressure pump, not necessarily the fuel circuit. But I know how fuel circuits work, at least the principles of them, even though I've never worked on this particular engine. So, we need to basically make sure it's got some low side fuel pressure and we need to make sure it's not sucking air. So the easiest thing to do is make sure it's not sucking air. So, what I did is this. So this is our inlet, you can tell because arrow in, which would mean this is our outlet. So it goes through our filter and goes out. Now what you don't want is a lot of air bubbles. Some are very large. That's a problem. That's too much air, especially for a little engine like this. It doesn't have a huge fuel circuit, so you can really see it's like a lot of air. So, one thing I noticed is when you, what I showed you already, is when you pump this, I have to get one pump. Whole bunch of air. Look at that. It basically all air. 
So this definitely needs replaced, but this doesn't really do, you can hear the engine shut down now due to the air. It's just, that's a lot of air. So this is a Napa filter also, not a cat filter, which you know my preferences are on that. Uh, one thing I did notice is this was not fully tight. It was somewhat loose. Now, you don't have to crank these down with like an impact, but we're just gonna tighten that a little bit, and see if it makes a difference. like it did a little bit so the air bubbles are much smaller now and they're almost gone there's almost always a little bit of air look look at that the air bubbles are basically gone there's still some but not the huge ones like it was before where it was stumbling so i think we got a bad fuel filter here and this is definitely bad um, i think what i'm going to do is pull this assembly off clean it, replace this, and it's getting a new fuel filter anyways because it's getting a service. And then I'll leave this line on and we'll test it after the fact, all right? Now I mentioned this thing's also getting a service, and our shop has the worst oil drain system I've ever seen. It's these big like torpedo things and it's all cast iron. I think these were around when Idaho was founded in the 1890s and they're still being used. I hate them. Now, in order to do the service, you have to go under the engine, obviously. There's this disgusting panel you have to remove, and then a bunch of mud and grease is going to fall on you, and then you got to take the drain plug out. But I have stopped using our horrible drain system, and I actually bought this, which is a Lincoln oil evacuation system. Now, what this does is it actually pulls the oil out through the dipstick tube. Now, why did I buy this? Well... When I do my own vehicle oil changes, I use a vacuum system to pull the oil out through the dipsticks. I've been doing it for years. I think there's a lot of benefits to it. It will get a lot. It'll get just as much oil as draining it, and it makes it a lot cleaner. You don't have to worry about the stupid drain plug getting stripped out or anything. And a lot of cool features. This will actually tell you how much oil you evacuated out. It holds up to 20 gallons, so you could actually do like two truck services or a couple RV services. That ball valve there is for the purge line, or the drain line. So when you're done sucking it out, you can actually pressurize this tank, and then, under pressure, drain the system out. You don't have to like pour it in a bucket or anything. Now the way it works is, there's a couple ball valves. This one engages the gauge and the suction line, and then you have a Venturi effect uh, valve here. And it's very quiet. It's uh, surprisingly quiet, actually. I use an airlift cooling system, vacuum system, that's much louder. This is very quiet. You can barely hear it if you're a couple feet away. And when you open this valve, this actually starts pulling air out of the tank. You can see the vacuum gauge is showing that it's filling the vacuum. Now, you always want to do this hot. You don't want to do oil changes cold, whether you're draining it through the drain plug or using the suction system. But if you do it very cold and use the suction system, it takes a lot longer maybe up to 10 times as long because the oil viscosity is much thicker when it's cold. Now what I like to do is I bought some quarter inch airline here and it works amazing with this setup. And I've got a pretty long uh, tube here. It's about a 10 foot tube. And the reason I use that is for like RV dipstick tubes. Sometimes they're super long. Basically I like to go a little bit past where the dipstick would end and then wait till I can feel that I hit the bottom of the oil pan. You can see it's still building the vacuum. And within a couple seconds, there's another ball valve there. You're going to see that oil is getting pulled through this engine. Now, is it faster to drain out of the drain plug? Oh, there's oil. See, it's already pulling the oil out. Yes, if you were just going to time it and say, oh, okay, uh, let's pull the drain plug and it'll drain faster or use this system. It's faster to drain the oil. However... Draining the oil is never the big problem when doing a service. It's getting the filters, it's checking everything, greasing everything. So what I usually do is, and it's got this, this is where you pressurize it. It's got this freighter valve, so you can just put air into it. Obviously, you can't put air into it and pull a vacuum. This would be after to drain the tank. So what I like to do is I like to pull a vacuum on it. Then I'll shut the Venturi off when it's at max. And then it'll just suck the oil out. Now, this only holds three or four gallons of oil, this little engine. So it'll take maybe 30 minutes. But while that's doing the work, I can change the filters. I can grease it. I can inspect it. 
I can do whatever. I could go to lunch. It can't leak because it's under vacuum. It can't overfill. There, there's really not many downsides to this setup. And it'll just keep pulling it there and I'm gonna go work on other stuff. I think I've talked about this suction system enough, but I'm gonna put a link in the description and in the comments section here. If you guys do wanna get one of these, click on the link. It actually helps the channel out a lot, all right? Thanks. Now, my previous grease video, everyone was surprised that I use a hand grease gun, and I do on trucks and RVs, but on equipment like this, I use the big pneumatic grease gun. It's just so much more grease this equipment takes than a truck. Uh, it just makes sense to get the big pneumatic one. So we are now, you can see the vacuum's off of max because guess what? It's pulled all the oil out of the engine. Once it, once it stops pulling liquid, it'll start sucking air and the, the vacuum will drop rapidly. I'll usually pull a vacuum again then and move the, uh, the tube around a little bit just to see if I can get just a little bit more out because depending on where the tube is sucking, it might be at a higher spot um, now I did this on a C15 once and I pulled the pan to see I was pulling the pan anyways for a rebuild to see how much oil it would get out it actually pulled more oil out than pulling the drain plug did because I pulled a lot of C15 pans and pulling the drain plug well it does get you know almost all the oil out this actually pulled more oil out and we can check how much we pulled out here it is pretty much exactly at four gallons which is about 16 liters. Now there's always a little oil left in the bottom, so it might've been about three and a half gallons. So we can see that we have, I've pulled the filter housing off and we've got pretty much a whole rebuild kit for it. I've cleaned it first. I've not replaced anything yet though. Threw it in our hot seat washer. And we're gonna be replacing the hand priming pump, the lock collars, any seals on this thing because basically it's sucking air there and you can see we've got all the new parts here and hopefully that will take care of our fuel priming problem. So you can see that I have taken this off, resealed it with a new O-ring. The old O-ring was super, super old and rock hard. The dipstick tube is no longer super loose like it was before. Uh, we've got a cat fuel filter here. New hand priming pump, a nice bronze finish on it. I resealed the purge valve and the lock collars. Got a new lock collar, and you can see the engine's running here. Now you might say to yourself, hey, it, it's still pulling air. Yes, but if you see, first off, the RPMs are higher, so it's, it's showing like it's pulling more air. But the bubbles are a lot smaller. There's no more of those really large bubbles like it was sucking before, occasionally. It's these little ones. And according to Cat, little bubbles are okay. Not only that, when you prime it now, it doesn't just pull in a whole bunch of air. It actually doesn't really pull in any air, which is what it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to be pulling air into the thing. So that pretty much fixed it. All I gotta do is take off the clear line here and then park the uh, piece of equipment outside and obviously take the seat and reinstall the seat. Now it's definitely not a truck, but... This destruction of the week, we have a truck. Thank goodness. And uh, what we're doing here is we've got some brakes here. It's a troubleshoot brake system. Now, with the uh, parking brake there applied, front brakes do not do the parking. It's the rear ones. So these should be locked. Uh, that would appear it's not locked. This one's obviously not locked. It's just spinning by itself for no reason. Now remember, this is the parking brake system. This truck could be parked on a steep hill, might have just rolled down, and who knows. Look at this. Three of the four wheels, or brakes, are not working at all. At least the parking brake system. So one of the four is not working. That That's just fantastic. Now one of the reasons it's not working, listen to this. This is the parking brake spring chamber, and this is actually super common. The spring, which is super, super strong and thick actually will break and this is what it should sound like i usually if i'm doing a dot inspection or something i'll tap these with a rubber mallet it doesn't hurt them but if there's like a jingle sound you know that the spring is broken and that can needs to be replaced that can did need to be replaced but this one's not working because look at that there's like a 
three eighths of an inch gap between the drum and the brake shoe. Uh, there's no gap on top. It turns out the uh, it had cammed over, obviously, but the lower roller was flipped out on the bottom, and that's why there was more gap on one side than the other. Thanks for watching the video.